All right, welcome. I'm hoping that this is the most profitable 30 minutes of your entire life. <laughs> um, so, by the way, my, my name is Mark Stiving. I do have a PhD in pricing. It's actually in marketing. Um, but you know, my dissertation was on 99 cents. Love the topic of pricing. I've been talking about pricing oh, my entire life. So there's two really fundamental concepts in pricing. You guys are shocked that I'm even telling you this, right? The single most profitable pricing strategy any company can adopt is value-based pricing. Now, value-based pricing has a really simple meaning. It means charge what our customers are willing to pay. It is impossible to do perfectly. You cannot read your customer's mind. You do not know how much your customer is willing to pay. But we can make decisions constantly to get us closer and closer to that objective. So we're going to take value-based pricing as a goal or, a, or an objective, something we're trying to achieve, because we know we can't get there perfectly. And, and so our customers, the only reason they ever give us money is because they think they get more value than they gave us in dollars, always. Think about the last thing you bought. Doesn't matter what it was. The only reason you bought it was because you thought it gave you more value than it cost you. That's it. Now, how many of you uh, talk to your salespeople, have ever lost a deal, and the salesperson said it was because the price was too high? <laughs> Wait, you mean some hands didn't go up? I'm shocked. <laughs> really? Really? Now, by the way, I'm going to tell you that that's a true statement. Right? The price really was too high because if you had lowered the price to zero, customer would have bought it. Right? But that's only half the equation. The other half of the equation is the value that the customer perceived was too low. Because what if the customer just didn't know that you guys tape gold bars to the bottom of your products before you ship them? Right? Had we been able to explain our value better, our customers would have bought our product. So yes, we always lose on price, and yes, we always lose on value. It's both sides of that equation. We're gonna spend a ton of time talking about value. In my view of the world, we need to take ourselves and put ourselves in the shoes of each individual buyer. What is that buyer thinking? What is that buyer thinking, actually? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but we want to be thinking how our buyers think always. And so what is value? Value, I think of value as having two different types of value. One type of value is called inherent value. The inherent value is what's the value of solving the problem? Out of curiosity, how much value do you get out of having air to breathe? A lot? Yeah. Like everything you own? Type a lot, okay? So this is called relative or inherent value. Inherent value is what's the value of solving the problem? What's the value of having air to breathe? On the other hand, what city am I in? Denver. Denver. I just captured, <laughs> I just captured some fresh Denver air. Anybody want to buy it? It's low quality. Yeah, not very good. Not very good. Okay, not today. Not today. Um, so, so you don't want to buy it. Why not? because you have all the free air around you that you need. Right? This is called relative value. What's the value relative to the alternatives? And so from your perspective, air is either worth everything you own or absolutely nothing, depending on if we're talking about inherent value or relative value. Our customers get to decide what value is, as we already know. And so when we think about this concept of inherent value and relative value, it really comes down to these two decisions. Our buyers almost always make both of these decisions. Am I going to buy something in the product category? That's the will I decision. After I've said yes, they go on to say, which one am I going to go buy? Imagine for a brief moment that you don't play the guitar. I can tell you I don't. Uh, and tomorrow morning, your significant other nudges you and says, honey, I'd really like it if you learned to play the guitar and sing me a love song. 
You're like, oh my gosh, that pulls at your heartstrings. You're thinking, I got to go buy a guitar now. Right? Notice you just said yes to the will I decision. Right? Also notice we didn't even talk about price. What do you do next? You go to the guitar store. In the guitar store, you start looking at different guitars. What's the guitar I need? To, which one fits me the best? Which one sounds the best? How much do they cost? So now we're looking at getting the best bang for the buck when we make this which one decision. We need to be super clear when we're thinking about our buyers as to what decision they are making. Are they making a will I decision or are they making a which one decision? Because when buyers are making the will I decision, they're looking at inherent value. What's the value of solving the problem? What's the value of having air to breathe? What's the value of singing a love song to your significant other? Right? What's the value of solving the problem? Then, once we've said yes, most of the time we go on and say, okay, what's the best bang for the buck? What, do I really, what am I actually going to go buy? Love the bow tie. Now, how am I going to not look at you all day? <laughs> um, so, so which one is the best for the alternative? And understand, most of our buyers go through both of these decisions. So let's do the easy one first. Green beans. This is the which one decision. Your significant other says to you, honey, I need a can of green beans. I need them fast. Run to the store. Get me a can of green beans. So you go to the store. Here are your two choices. You can buy Del Monte for $1.69. You can buy Safeway Kitchens for $1.49. This actually says no salt added, so that's not a good excuse to buy a Safeway. And you get to choose a can. I don't care which one you buy, Safeway, Del Monte. Who's buying Del Monte? Not, not that many. Who's buying Safeway? More. Okay. Del Monte, folks. Someone from Del Monte. Tell me who. Tell me why. Who, who, did you say Del Monte? Tell me why. Brand recognition. Brand recognition trust it. Okay. So anyone? Anyone real fast? Uh, I didn't see no salt added until you pointed out on the Safeway. Oh, it's on both, but that's okay. So you, you just don't like the salt. Well, was Are you going to change your mind now? It was more visible on the Del Monte, <laughs> Looks like higher quality. OK, so for those of you who said uh, Safeway, tell me why. Someone? Tell me. Honestly, price. Same green bean. OK, so it's very possible it's the same green bean in the same factory, in the same can, with a different label. Very possible. I know, how embarrassing, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Now, so it turns out I don't actually care which one you chose. What matters is how you made the decision. And every one of you made the decision the exact same way. You each said, Del Monte is 20 cents more. Is it worth it? Some of you said yes. Some of you said no. This is exactly how your customers decide between your product and a competitor's product. Which one's more expensive? Is it worth it? So value, when we're up against competition, is all about differentiation. What is it that's better about your product? And what's the value of that differentiation to your customer? Now, my favorite part of the story is it actually doesn't matter what's true. It only matters what your customer believes. Some of you believe it's the same green bean in the same can. Some of you believe Del Monte has better quality. I actually don't know the truth. And it doesn't matter. What matters is what you believe. What matters is what your customers believe. And so what you want to do is build products that are better than your competitors' products, but you have to market that. You have to tell people, you have to make sure people understand your product really is better. There really is more value. OK, that was the easy one, and that was fun. I'm sorry, that was an OK. Let's do the fun one. The fun one is the will I decision. Um, who's been bungee jumping? We got a few. Where'd you go? New Zealand. I'm looking for New Zealand. Anyone go to New Zealand? OK, where'd you on vacation? Where, where, where? You don't even remember. 
Okay, well, let's pretend it was Roatan. You're not, you're not going to be very good with this. I've got to tell you that right now. <laughs> let's pretend it was Roatan, okay? Um, out of curiosity, you're standing in Roatan, and uh, you're looking at the bungee jumping place, and you're thinking to yourself, I'm either going to go bungee jumping or not, or you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to go bungee jumping here, or I'm going to go bungee jumping somewhere else. Which decision were you trying to make? Okay, so it's like we're going to do it or not. Okay, got it. How much was it? Do you remember? It was 150. Just go with me, okay? It was 150. Yeah, I like that number better. It makes my story nicer. Okay. Um, so you paid 150 bucks. Would you have gone for 200? My wife told me to, yeah. 250? 300? Maybe a little handed plus one at that point. 500. <laughs> okay. So, so notice that price isn't driving that decision. Something else is driving that decision. Okay, the rest of you, what's your name? Steve. Steve. The rest of you all happen to be Steve's really good friends. You are in Roatan, standing next to him in front of the bungee jumping place. You are allowed to ignore his wife, by the way. Um, so you're standing next to Steve. It's only 150 bucks. Who's going with him? Come on, let's see. We've got a few takers, not many. So those of you who didn't raise your hand, 125. 100, 75. Oh, we're getting some takers at 75. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. Really important point. Price isn't driving your decision. Right? I can move the price enough to get people to change their mind sometimes. Right? I couldn't. How much do I have to pay you to go? Right? So, so, so I can move the price enough to get you to change your mind. But price isn't driving this decision. The reason this is so important is because sometimes our buyers don't make which one decisions. They only make a will I decision and then they buy something. And when that happens, price is not driving that decision. If you can find those, go raise your price 10% tomorrow. So when buyers are only making will I decisions, here's an example, a competitive alternative was not considered, popcorn at the movie theater. All right, so, so you decide what theater you want to go to, what movie you want to see, you walk in the front door of the theater, and then you ask yourself, am I going to take out a mortgage today for popcorn or not? Right? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> totally okay, right? But, but notice it's expensive because there's no competitive alternative. You're driving down in the middle of nowhere, so you see the sign that says last gas 75 miles. You look down at your gas gauge, you've got an eighth of a tank left. You ask yourself, or you pull off to get gas. You see the price of gas is four times what it is in the city. Are you buying gas? Right? Well, I'm not, you're not, absolutely, you're not going to fill the tank. I'm with you, right? But you're buying gas. Here's my favorite iPhones. If you are using an iPhone today, you are probably thinking the following. Am I going to upgrade to the new iPhone 14 or not? But here's what you're not thinking. You're not thinking, am I going to upgrade to the new 14 or switch to Android? <laughs> the new iPhone 14 is a will I decision. Do you know that Android has 72% market share of cell phones, smartphones in the world? Do you know that Apple makes 85% of the profit in cell phones in the world? That's because Apple knows they're selling a will I product. And so, when you think about a customer that's only making a will I decision, they're not going to go on and compare you to a competitive alternative. You can think about this in two different ways. Will I products and will I situations? Will I products are like the iPhone we just talked about. Um, in most places, your electric utility is the only place you can get electricity from. They raise your prices. You get all mad. You say, I'm going to use less electricity. And that lasts for about a week. And then you go back to using all the electricity you used before that. Right? These are products where there are no comp competition. But here's one that most of you have, add-ons or options. 
If you have someone who's already bought into your product, already love your company, already buying from you, they want to buy the expedited service. They want to buy the HDMI cable. They want to buy the whatever the heck it is. Guess what? They're only going to buy it from you. This is free money. Go raise the price at least 10% tomorrow. Will I situations? These are situations where typically our products have competition, but in these situations, they don't. Um, so we just talked about popcorn at the theater, last gas. How about someone that you have a really good relationship with? They love you. They're shopping for something new. They're just going to come talk to you. I mean, you can't gouge them, but you don't have to give them deep discounts. How about a referral? Someone says, oh, you should go talk to this company. It's possible they're not going to look at a competitive alternative. My recommendation, if you can teach your salespeople this trick, by the way, my recommendation is always assume there's no competition until you know otherwise. And if you want to know, ask this question. Do not say, are you looking at my competitors? Right? That implies there's competitors. Ask this question. If you don't buy this, what are you going to do? Implying there is no competition. So here's the money I'm handing to you today. Find and build more Will I products and situations. If you go through your product portfolio, if you go through your customers that have purchased through you recently, Think about decisions or products that they've made where they didn't compare you to a competitive alternative. In each one of those, we left money on the table. Can we recognize that ahead of time and raise prices? Or at least not give as deep a discount. For those of you who happen to be in a subscription business or if you're selling recurring revenue, so you're selling to customers over and over and over and over and over again. This is a fascinating chart on value. So think of this, the y-axis as how your customers are getting or, or perceiving value. Think of your x-axis as, uh, let's, call it, let's call it the lifetime value of a customer. Right? How much value am I going to get from a customer? So here we've got these people who have never bought our product before. These are all potential customers. You know, some aren't going to get much value. Some are going to get a lot of value. But all of it is about perceived value. It's all about what do they believe. And these customers, our goal is to go win these customers. However, you have a bunch of customers already. These customers, some of them, hate to say this, some of them don't like you. Some of them love you. But what's fascinating is it's no longer perceived value, it's now real value. They use your product, they know your product, they know if they're getting value from you or not. So it doesn't matter what you told them, it matters what they get. And when we think about the ones at the bottom, we have to be focused on how do we keep these customers. Don't take the picture yet, just a second, just a second. <laughs> the ones at the top, now take it. The ones at the top, <laughs> these are the ones that we need to grow. So these customers are waiting to buy more from you. Our thought is, how do we get them to pay us more money next year than they paid us this year? Well, here's an easy one. Please forgive me for saying this. Raise their price. They love you. They're not going to love a price increase. I'm not pretending that they will. But they'll take it because they love you. OK, that was number one. Number two, I told you there were going to be two foundational concepts here. Second one is price segmentation. Uh, you probably didn't need me to tell you that we want to do price segmentation either, but we need reminded of it regularly. Uh, so price segmentation is the second most profitable pricing strategy. It simply means we're going to charge different prices to different customers based on their willingness to pay. Super easy concept to understand. So you may recall I said we want to put ourselves in the shoes of this buyer. Try to understand what they're thinking. Is this buyer thinking the same thing that this buyer's thinking? Or the same thing that this buyer's thinking? Or the same thing that this buyer's thinking? 
we need to think like our buyers think. We can think like individual buyers, or we can think like specific market segments. <laughs> this is exactly what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to say, who's willing to pay me more money? How do I get them to pay me more money? Now, mind you, we want it to look fair. This doesn't look fair, so we wouldn't do it this way. But, uh, but there are many ways that we can do price segmentation and keep it looking fair. So these are three techniques that you could use to go do price segmentation now. These th three techniques are customer characteristics, transaction information, behaviors, customer characteristics. What do you know about your customers that tell you these customers are willing to pay more than those customers? So it could be what geography are they in, right? I used to be in the semiconductor industry. In semiconductors, we sold products to the US and Europe at higher prices than we did in Asia. Could be the industry. We sold product, if you're in the medical industry, I apologize. We sold products to the medical industry at higher prices than we did to any other industry, right? Why? Because they were willing to pay it, right? That's the only reason that they were willing to pay it. Um, transaction information. What can we learn at the time of the transaction that will help us understand how much our customers are willing to pay? Uh, San Francisco Giants were the very first baseball team to implement dynamic pricing. Uh, so they would change the prices on tickets based on a lot of different factors. But my favorite factor was the weather. Right? Tickets were lower priced on rainy days than on sunny days. Doesn't that make sense? Right? What can I learn at the time of the transaction that'll help me understand how price sensitive my customers really are? If a customer wants it expedited, needs it tomorrow, are they price sensitive? Right. So there are lots of things that we can learn at the time of the transaction. The last one, um, behaviors, or you can think of this as hurdles. Uh, what's a hurdle that we can put in someone's way that, pr that makes them Prove to us that they're price sensitive. This one works well in B2C. It doesn't work as well in B2B, but we can talk about it a little bit. But this is simply saying uh, coupons. Coupons are a great example of this. Right? I don't use coupons, but, but if you gave me 50% off a of Lexus, I'd probably use a coupon. <laughs> right? it's, it's worth my time. But, but most you know, people who choose to save money by using coupons there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, right? But what they're saying is, I'm price sensitive. Right? So if you use coupons, what you're doing is trading your life for money. Mind you, there's nothing wrong with that. We all do it. It's called a job, right? Um, but, but those of us who use coupons just are saying, hey, I'm price sensitive. I'm going to use a coupon. And some of us choose not to do that. So those are the three techniques that we can use for, for price segmentation. Don't forget your product portfolio. So th each of these three techniques are essentially saying, I can take the exact same product and get different people to pay me different prices for it. But as soon as you step back and say, well, wait, 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 I can adjust my product portfolio, you can build a product for different market segments. So in semiconductors, we would take a, a chip, a, a semiconductor, and we would, uh, we would burn it in, meaning that we let it, burn, let it run while it was in an oven for 24 hours or 48 hours, and we sold it to NASA and the airlines for prices 100 to 1,000 times higher than the part would normally cost. Why? Because they would pay it, right? So can we understand which market segments are not price sensitive, tweak our product, make it perfect for them, and then they'll buy it. And then once you get inside a market segment, you can start building good, better, best product portfolios. You can get people who are not price sensitive to buy your best product, people who are very price sensitive to buy your good product. We can start to use the product portfolio to do price segmentation. So here's more money, by the way. Use price segmentation to raise prices on a subset of your buyers. 
If you step back today and think about it, I can almost guarantee you, you can think of a subset of buyers where you could use price segmentation and raise prices. Now here's a quick hint. Do this once, right? Create one new market, one new price segment. Every time you create a new segmentation technique, you complicate the internal workings of your company. Okay. I can almost guarantee you that doing it the next time is not too complicated, just do it. But as you do it this time, and then the next time, and then the next time, you're gonna start trading off how, how, much, how complicated am I making the internal workings versus how much more money am I making from my marketplace. But we started off with this slide, customers trade money for value. They've never bought anything that they didn't think they were gonna get more value for. Uh, and, oh, I have three books that I've written. Do you guys have any questions? I, I'm thrilled to answer any questions. Oh, come on. Um, so fabulous question, and I have no idea what the answer is. Uh, so, <laughs> so there isn't a standard answer to the question. The question that I would ask you is, um, are they making a will-I decision, or are they making a which-one decision? Let's assume it's a will-I decision. Um, my standard rule of thumb is I can if I can calculate how much economic value a customer is going to get, we should be able to get in the ballpark at 10% of that number as our part of that fee. Uh, some companies try to get more, but 10% seems pretty reasonable. If they're making a which one decision, now the question is if they don't buy my product, whose are they going to buy? And how much better is my product than their product? Uh, and, and so that's really what drives how much of a premium I could get, is how much better is my product. Yes? So, so can I tell you how much I love that question? I only have three minutes to answer it, though. Um, <laughs> so the question is, how do we get to economic value? And, uh, and how do we get our customers to believe it? Okay? So here's the long answer. Read this book. Okay? Now here's the short answer. Um, whenever someone buys our product, especially in the B2B world, let's talk about B2B uh, specifically, the only reason someone buys our product is because they think it's going to make them profit. How much profit? Now, they actually haven't gone through the effort to figure that out. But if we have good salespeople, we can go figure that out with them. And the way we do that is we start out by saying, hey, we built this product that has a whole bunch of features. Um, what are the problems that, that those features solve? If we understand those problems really clearly, and by the way, that's really hard for companies to do. I've seen companies struggle with this forever. But, uh, but once you can define your set of problems, then you go on to say, okay, given that you have this problem, I have the solution, I solve that problem, what's the result that you might get? What's a quantifiable result you might get? And that quantifiable result could be 2% uh, more productivity, 3% lower turnover, 4% higher conversion rate, right? whatever, whatever the quantitative result is. And then using business acumen, we should be able to take that, that quantitative result and turn that into profit dollars for the customer. Now, what I haven't answered is how do you get the customer to believe that? If you walk in the door and say, hey, Mr. Customer, uh, do you have this problem? And they go, yeah. And we say, well, you know, if you solve this problem, you're gonna get 3% lower turnover, and that's gonna turn into $3 million. They don't believe you. But if instead of telling them the answer to the question, you say, well, if we could solve that problem, what do you think that would do for you? And they say, I'll bet, you, I'll bet you that would reduce turnover. And, and you were going to tell them 3%, and odds are good they say, well, I'll bet that reduces turnover by 5%. Right? Like, they're giving you bigger numbers than you were going to give them. And then you say, well, what's that worth to the company? And they go, I don't know. Okay, well, let's do the calculations. 
what's it cost every time you lose an employee? What's it and so we start doing the math with them. We let them do all the math, and when we get to the end, they look at a number, and they're like, oh my gosh, really? It's, so that's the only way to get them to believe it. So I tell you what, you take one salesperson and teach them to do this well, and they're closing deals at higher margins, higher ASPs, they're making more commission. Change your commission plan. By the way, here's some free money. Uh, change your commission plan to pay, God, I hate saying this word, not on margin, but if you set a, a floor target list price and pay different percentages based on where they are in that space, then, then the, the salespeople that are up here at the top making all the money, everybody wants to be them. They'll go figure out what it takes. 